Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. It's uh, it's re really nice to uh, to be back here in uh, Treaty Six, in uh, Treaty Six territory, Métis homelands, and um, we're gonna have a good day. And uh, for me to be here uh, to be welcomed back uh, to Think Indigenous uh, is a, is a real honor for me. I kind of tricked uh, Chris into it because uh, when he gave me tobacco, I said this locks in my contract for four years, and uh, so it's uh, I got another two after this one. Um, We'll keep it sacred, right? Four, and then after this, I'll trick another conference into hiring me for four years. That's no one's laughing. Okay, um, it's like that's abuse of medicine. Yeah, I know. Um, I have to get ahead somehow. We can't all be Don Bernstick. <laughs> um, it is. Uh, it is an honor to be here, and. Um, uh, I want to start just with some uh, some opening remarks about uh, about last year, and uh, last year, uh, who was here last year? Actually, by by just by round of applause, let me hear if you were here. Yeah, who's uh, who's who's uh, here for the first year at Think Indigenous? Put your hands together. Wow. So quite a mix. Um, so if you were here last year, you'll remember. Um, just how dynamic our, our speakers' lineup was, and just how incredible the presentations were. Very diverse in ideas, in, in content, uh, in focus as well. And, and I think that diversity speaks to the type of work that we do, uh, both inside of our schools and inside of our community. And uh, what we experienced last year were, uh, were some really challenging presentations, a, a, a call to arms, if you will. Uh, there was a call by a couple of our presenters uh, focusing on indigenous languages, focusing on the importance of our young people uh, retaining and relearning uh, and embracing our language. There was a call uh, by a couple of our presenters to start thinking outside of the box, educators, to not be so married to that uh, uh, provincial curriculum and, and to start thinking about how we can best serve uh, indigenous young people in, in 2016. There were calls to action in terms of sports, in terms of art, in terms of the types of uh, ways that we uh, present these, uh, these, these types of education to our young people inside the classroom, outside the classroom, on the land, uh, etc. Uh, during the lunch last year, uh, uh, as a host, I, I'll, I'll come out and I'll, I'll, I'll spend time with you uh, throughout the day and I'll talk with you. And one of the most amazing parts of last year was uh, during the lunch when there were women uh, that I sat with uh, sharing bologna sandwiches. And uh, that's what is for lunch again. Um, but sharing bologna sandwiches and, and talking about the challenges they face and just how inspired they were just by the first couple of hours in our presentations and, and checking in with them throughout the day, kind of getting uh, feedback on what they thought and, and their minds were blown, just absolutely blown. And they felt like they could go back to their classrooms and make a difference. They felt like what they heard at Think Indigenous just in that first morning reflected their ideals and reflected the things that they aspired to do. And I believe it was Chris actually in his, um, in, in, in his uh, 20 minute uh, red talk that called for um, uh, teachers to be brave. And that word really stuck out uh, for me uh, last year, was bravery. And you are all educators, and to me, and I said this last year and I'll say it again, you are the heroes in our community. You get paid too little, you work too hard, and your work travels with you. You can't just leave the kids or what happened in the day uh, in the classroom. You take these stories and you take these lives with you. When you see them in the community, you say hi to them. Uh, when you see them at the powwow, you probably buy them a meal. Um, you are the absolute heroes in, in our community. And it takes a special person to want to give their life to the education of young people. It takes a special person that wants to dedicate their professional career to making our communities better. And it is this spirit in which we meet here today to continue the conversations about the way forward in education, to continue the conversations about just what we have to do in this era of reconciliation to not only bring our own children up to speed in terms of education, but now to bring Canadians up to speed. We have inherited quite a mess. And this mess, respectfully, is called reconciliation. 
and this curriculum change and this giant wave of feel-good energy that we're all supposed to embrace is really challenging in the classroom. It's really challenging for me as an artist. It's challenging in terms of who is going to create this curric curriculum, how is this curriculum going to be created, when are we going to deliver it, um, et cetera, et cetera. And in this era of reconciliation, I believe we have a bit of a reset button that we're able to hit. I believe that we're in a time that we've never been in before. We're in a time where we can determine how we are going to teach this history to our young people. I believe we're in a, a time in history where we get to determine just what we are going to pass on to our young people and what we are going to hold onto for ourselves. Do we want to burden our young people, these perfect little individuals that don't carry the weight of the past, do we need to burden them with all of the details? In our language, in Anishinaabemowin, we have a word called biskabiyang. And that concept of biskabiyang is an important one. And what that concept is about is, is about looking backwards in order to look forward. And when I listen to teachings around the concept of biskabiyang, what I hear time and time again is that eagles never fly looking backwards is that the eagle always flies looking forward. And in this day and age where in my life, in my education, I didn't have the benefit of not standing in the middle of the trauma and trying to learn in the trauma, trying to live daily uh, in my own life and in my education, uh, experiencing these types of violences that we do uh, so often. But I think we're coming into a new time. I believe and I trust in the teachings that the elders say is that we're never handed anything we can't handle, that we are where we are supposed to be right now. And so today I look forward to these conversations, these red talks, these presentations. I hope they challenge your own thinking. I hope they challenge your own concepts around indigenous education. And I hope that today we can have these conversations carry forward uh, into the future. And the word bravery that I brought up earlier, I think, is something that I would like to oppose to uh, this group of educators here today, is how can we be more brave? How can we make that vow to ourselves and to our students to continue to push back against this colonial state that for so long has simply tried to kill us? It hasn't worked, and we're still here due to the resiliency, the strength, and the beauty of our elders and our wisdom. We are here because our elders promised to fight. And that fight is ongoing. This is the fight that you continue inside of your classrooms uh, each and every day. In this way and in this spirit, I hope that today, through these presentations, we are able to open up these doorways just a little bit wider. I hope that after these presentations, we get to sit, share tea, and talk a little bit further about the ins and outs of these best practices. What's really, really powerful and what's really, really beautiful is that the speakers that are coming up here today that you will hear are bringing their own stories. And stories are powerful. Uh, we use, a, we use a, a word, Daba Jamajig, back home. That's a personal story. When you share a personal story, it reveals a truth. And today, a number of our speakers here are bringing their personal stories to reveal their personal truth so as to share perspective on these best practices and it's going to be a powerful, uh, powerful day. Indigenous knowledge, of course, is not just found inside of the classroom. Um, I would be uh, remiss if I did not say that some of the most exciting uh, educational concepts that I've come across in uh, North America are happening in indigenous communities and are happening out on the land. Um, you can go to Dashinta Bush University up in the Northwest Territories, where you get university credit for tanning moose hides. Uh, you can learn about um, Anishinaabe law at the Seven Generations Education Institute in uh, Northwestern Ontario in Treaty 3. All across Indian country, our ideas around education are changing. And it's that type of bravery and vision that uh, I really think is exciting. And I really think is the next wave of what will happen uh, inside of our communities on a go-forward basis, especially in the era of truth and reconciliation. And for those administrators, those uh, people at the top, for those that sort of uh, run things, generally, they're not indigenous people, so I hope uh, some of you are here. Uh, please uh, listen intently today. 
There are going to be amazing ideas floated past you, and I hope you catch them all and, uh, and bring them forward uh, to your colleagues to start to really look at how we can unlearn what we've learned. To me, uh, this project that we're under in reconciliation, in the era of reconciliation, I'm calling it a massive re-education. I think the country needs a total overhaul in terms of education, and I'm calling it a re-education project. And that re-education of this country has to do with indigenous knowledge systems. It has to do with not elders coming in to say an opening prayer, and I'm not talking about this space here, but in our schools or in our gatherings, it's not an opening prayer and then they're done for the day. Our elders, our singers, our aunties, our grandmothers, they are knowledge keepers. Our women keep our law back home in Treaty 3. When a pipe is presented to a man, it is the women that decide where that pipe will go. The drum was given to the man by woman, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have a lot to learn through indigenous law and in our, our own ways that we conduct ourselves inside of our communities. And there are no accidents. The story of the blueberry for Anishinaabe people is one that I turn to often that is so, so rich in what it teaches us about law, about governance, about kinship, about community. And it's such a powerful story that is so dense, I think you could probably spend an entire school year on this story alone. And it's the treaty and it's the agreement made between Anishinaabe, the blueberry, and the makwa, the bear, where they agreed to take care of each other in trade and in agreement with each other for their relationships that they would, they would agree to have. And at one time, the blueberries grew in singular fashion on top of the trees, and Anishinaabe was hungry. And Anishinaabe called to the creator and said, Gije Manitou, we need these, these medicines, we need this berry to come down to the ground. Because it is so tiring to climb to the top of the tree and pick a single berry. It takes so long and so much energy, we are going to starve to death. And Gije Manitou says, yes, I will bring those berries down and I will feed the people. And in fact, I will do one better Anishinaabe, because you've offered tobacco, you've offered that sacred medicine. I will bring these berries down to the ground and I'll put them in bushels for you to pick. And when you pick those berries in bushels, you will have plenty of medicine for the people. Well, Anishinaabe got greedy. And there were chubby Anishinaabes back in the day too, make no mistake. And the chubby ones that were standing there listening to Gije Manitou started rubbing their belly. Yeah, yeah, bring the berries, yeah. And Gije Manitou said, no, 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 I'm not bringing you the berries for you to be greedy. I'm bringing you the berries to, to provide that medicine and to, to provide what you need. And Anishinaabe still had big eyes. And Anishinaabe was still rubbing their belly. Yeah, he was carried away with it, kind of like I get when I see pancakes in the morning, you know, just like, yes. Let's do this. Let's eat away the sadness. No, I'm just, no. I'm not. I'm just, I'm joking. No. <laughs> no. But that's when uh, Gijé Manitou called on the uh, Bear Clan people, called on the, on, on the Bear Clan people, Makwando Dem, to come over. And he called on the Bear Clan to be the protectors of the blueberries. And whenever, to this day, whenever Anishinaabe get greedy with those blueberries, we'll run into bears as we pick. And it's this relational um, uh, system that we have in, uh, on the land, on, uh, on Aki, Anishinaabe Aki, that that relationship, it governs us. It's, it's scientific. If you dig a blueberry bush out of the ground, which I've had to do for my father, if you dig that blueberry bush out of the ground, that blueberry root is used in cancer medicine. And if we were to go out on the land to talk with elders about a simple blueberry, we would learn so much about this world. We would learn about why we are saying no to pipelines, why we are saying no to these types of things in our, in our, in our, in our territories, because it is the land that govern us. We have a concept, Manitou Aki in Akanagewin, that is an Anishinaabe resource law. It is the way that we relate uh, to that land. This is a law, it's a governance system, and it's Anishinaabe. And these are things that you won't learn in textbooks, of course, 
But I wanted to highlight this one example as such a dense concept that, again, I think you could spend years learning about. But this is the type of knowledge that is out on the land. This is the type of knowledge that is embedded for thousands of years in our communities. And this is the type of knowledge that our textbooks simply cannot teach us. So think indigenous today. Enjoy yourself. Have a good day. Thank you for listening to my half thought out tirade. I get passionate, Chris. I don't know. I see you give me this one, so I'll, I'll wrap it up. But I hope you all have a good, hello. I hope you all have a very good day. And uh, uh, thanks for allowing me to say uh, uh, just that much this morning. <laughs>